rainy day outside to talk about voting, right? So it's, the good news is it gets better from here, all right? Um, before I get started, I want to um, just tell you a little bit about what we do. We run the sailing school here at the marina. Um, we have a full youth program. If you have know some kids or um, you have some kids of your own, grandkids, nieces, nephews, you find some stragglers on the street, grab them, send them to sailing school this summer. Um, so we do day camps. Um, right up on the beach in front of the inn right here, which is a lot of fun. We have a great time doing that. We also do week-long cruising camps for teenagers. Uh, put them on a boat and send them off to sea for about a week, and we, we go with them, you know. And uh, <laughs> but they, you know, they get to do everything. They do all the navigating. We're just there to coach them all through the week, and they don't have to have any any experience. It's really fun. They, they have a blast. They go to all different locations all over the bay, and they come back just really wanting more sailing experiences. So it's a lot of fun. Um, we also do um, adult instruction. We're an ASA school. We do ASA 101 for beginners all the way up through, um, you know, offshore cruising, uh, navigating, coastal navigation. Um, we also do um, deliveries. <coughs> Some do a lot of them, but we usually only do them for folks in the marina here. But if the boat delivered to, you know, between here and the Caribbean, or we go, our kind of grounds is New England to the Caribbean. So. That's kind of where we, we go, where we also, and we also do private instruction. We do a lot of um, close quarters boat maneuvering, having any issues docking or um, um, boat handling, boat power and sail, just let us know, we'd be glad to work with you. Um, we're gonna be um, talking about safety at sea today. The 10 most common emergencies at sea and how to deal with them, okay? Um, interesting thing is, that what we'd really like to do, and just kind of give you a little bit more confidence is, is as you're, as you're boating, as you're doing things, a lot of these issues will come up. And the more confident you are in handling issues, the farther you can go and the less, you know, and the more, the more fun you can have, the more relaxed you can be. So these should be called, not emergencies at sea, but challenges at sea, okay? A challenge versus, a, um, challenge versus an emergency is, you know, a challenge is something that you can handle, right? You handle it well. If it's not, if it's handled poorly, it can, can turn into an emergency, all right? Uh, so we're going to go over the 10 most common things, and, and I like to say I'm, I'm good, very qualified to teach this because all these have happened to me multiple times. So um, we um, lived aboard our boat. This is me and my family about 15 years ago. Uh, lived aboard our, our boat for a few years, and we would travel between here down to the Bahamas and back a lot of times. Um, this is, like, you know, I told my wife, hey, come on, let's, get, let's buy a boat and let's put all five kids aboard and, and we could, uh, we'll just sail off to go to the Bahamas or something fun like that. And, you know, what, what could possibly go wrong, right? And so the seminar is based on, I mean, all the things that have gone wrong over the last 15 years. And uh, so hopefully you can avoid some of the mistakes and stuff that we've made. This is us today. Actually, not today. That was last um, Saturday down in the Bahamas. Um, I came back in just for the seminar. That's not true. I came back in. Um, we uh, spent about a week down there with our as a flotilla. We had a couple of boats going through the, the Abacos. We had a good time. And this has nothing to do with the seminars. It's a pretty picture I took. I just wanted to make you feel happy on a cloudy day. So uh, somehow, I'm not sure what happened. There's a couple of um, our, our flotilla vacation pictures that got stuck into my, my presentation this morning. So you have to forgive me for um, having some pictures in here. Um, first thing is having a pre-departure checklist. I have seen, and we, we give out to our students and stuff, we give out really extensive checklists, and I've seen some very, very well-developed checklists, but the problem is, if it's too long of a list, I won't usually go all the way through it because by the time I get to the marina, and I get to my boat, and I get my crew aboard, I don't want to waste a lot of time before I let my dock lines go. I'm kind of in a hurry to get out and start having fun. And so, we kind of pared it down to five most essential things that we want to check. And one is weather and tides, all right? I want to see what the weather's doing. Um, sometimes when I haven't prepared for the weather well enough or I haven't checked the weather, I'll head out through the breakwater up at north, and it'll be really, really rough out there. We'll do a nice U-turn and come right back in the marina to the slip and say, this is going to be a great day to kind of sit in the cockpit, have some hors d'oeuvres and stuff, and enjoy each other's company, um, but not a great day to be out there boating. Um, next thing is your bilge. Now, bilge is, is really important. A lot of the safety gear and things you can check will help you to make sure you're prepared if there is a problem. Your, your bilge will tell you right away if there is a problem, okay? So I'm really, really serious about checking my bilge all the time. Check it before I go out. While we're out, I usually give it a check or two, and then when I come back, I'll check it. I want to make sure that I've got, um, that I'm not taking on water. There's no, no, no leaks anywhere coming in the boat. 
Um, it's really good to have, I don't have one on my boat, but I've been on other boats, a ton of boats that have this, you know, high water alarms. If the boat comes in, some water comes in your boat, the alarm will go off if it reaches a certain level. Another good thing to have is a, is a bilge pump um, counter, all right? They're fantastic. Um, if you get to your boat, maybe the bilge pump's gone off a couple times while you were gone. You don't know how many times it's cycled. So it's a really great idea to put a, a bilge pump counter in there, a cycle, a cycle counter. And if it's going off, you know, 30 times a day, I, w I got a problem. I want to know why, okay? Next thing is your safety gear. There are uh, five things the Coast Guard requires you to have, all right? And, and it's a good idea just to go through them. Now, especially with, with folks in, who have boats and stuff, we are usually bringing people out who are new boaters, all right? And if I have to go through my safety gear check, and I at least have to point the things out, First of all, it reminds me where it is, all right? And, if, and you go through, like, for instance, your fire extinguishers and say, okay, we've got several fire extinguishers aboard. Here's one, here's another. You gotta go, oh yeah, well, I, I know where it is, it's right. And then you find it. You say, okay, this is where it is right here. And it reminds you where it is, okay? So um, safety gear, fire extinguishers. Um, you need to have your, your personal life jackets. Um, I really like, we've gone to all, We've gone to all spin locks, and we've got, I don't know, maybe about 20 or 30 years at our school. And I just love this thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really nice to, it's quick to buy the little, little pack of the orange ones and throw it in your boat so you're, you know, the, the Coast Guard's happy when they stop you and you can see all your life jacket packs. But I like wearing a life jacket that's going to that's gonna really help me out. It's going to be really safe. Um, a lot of life jackets that you buy, let's see if I don't screw the microphone too much, don't have the leg straps to them, okay? And these are really important, all right? If, if you have an inflatable and you've never blown it up before, I recommend taking your life jacket out. Don't, don't pull the, um, the pin on there and inflate it with the CO2 cartridge, but take your CO2 cartridge out. There's usually a tube in here. You can inflate it just by blowing into it. Blow into it and put it on and jump in the water and see what happens, okay? A lot of life jackets, you jump in the water, and you, if, your, if your arms go up, it'll just come right off of you. So make sure it's, 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 it's properly fit. Um, this is one I wear when I'm offshore. They do make, Spinlock makes a, a lighter one. Um, but this one's awesome. It has a, a spray hood that can come over my head so I can take waves over, over and I'm not just gasping for breath, all right? Um, you can test that also, grab a kid and have him squirt water from the hose at you while you're trying to sit in the float, float in the pool or something. Um, it also has a, a light that will come up. It's got a Lumon um, things in here that will, that will illuminate the whole life jacket, all right? It's not just one little light you're going to look for. My whole life jacket will all light up, all right? Uh, so, and I also have the, um, the tethers. Now, I don't usually wear a tether if I'm playing with other people in the daytime, but at nighttime or if I'm by myself, I'll go ahead and click in, okay? So these are awesome jackets, and this one has a little um, thing I can put some lip balm or a little snack or something in there. Um, so other, other safety gear, check your fire extinguishers, check your life jackets, make sure you have um, your, your nav lights, that's, they're also required. Check your, um, let me see what else is required by the Coast Guard. You need to have your flares, all right, flare kits. Now, usually the flares that we have, we will take the, we will get these little packs from, from West Marine. All of our school boats have these on there. If you're, you know, in the bay, I think these are fine. These work really well. If you're going on a more extensive cruise, I would really recommend getting some aerial flares, all right? And if you're going, doing more than just, you know, near coastal cruising, then definitely get some upgraded flares. Parachute flares are probably the best, all right? They've got the, they're the brightest, the solace parachute flares. I carry a, a kit with, with a lot of those in there when I, when I go on <coughs> deliveries are offshore, more extended trips, all right? So these are fine for, right, for local, local, but I definitely um, recommend upgrading to the, the solace aerial flares and the rocket propelled flares. Um, so we covered your you know, life jackets, your, your, your type 4 throwable along with that, you, um, your um, flares, um, your, let me see, your horn, whistle, or bell. 
we use those little air horns, right? You got a little canister. Unfortunately, those don't last a whole long time. I've had those burn out on me, so test those. Have an extra canister with you. Uh, there's some newer ones that you can, you can pump up, and I like those a lot. You just grab a little bicycle pump, pump the air horn up, and, and you have unlimited uses with that one. Those are, those are fantastic if you don't have one that's integrated or electronic one. Um, check your rigging. If you're a sailor, go through your, and, and check the rigging on your boat. Check cotter pins, clevis pins. Just take a look at things. Check your standing and running rigging. If you're, if you're a power boater, the nice thing is you only have four of these things on the list to remember, right? If you're a sailor, you need to remember to check the rigging. Um, your engine, I go through and I'll just check my, my fluids, all right? Make sure that the fluid levels are topped off. Make sure they're in the right levels. Once you start your engine, then um, you can make sure the cooling water is flowing correctly, all right? So just basic, basic checks on your engine. I also will, on my engine, I'll check forward and reverse thrust before I let my dock lines go, all right? I learned that the hard way one time, right? Because, you you know, I, I, I clicked it in gear, and I was like, okay, it's shifting correctly, and I, I put it back in reverse, and put it, it goes in reverse fine. Well, then I um, let go of some of the dock lines, and they're very tight slips, my crew has helped getting me out in the water. Right? And then we, we put it in gear and tried to go, we push it forward and nothing happens. And it's moving lots of water around, all right? So it's working but it's not moving us anywhere. And turned out in that case, it was a foul propeller. We had a lot of marine growth on the propeller. And so we had, uh, I don't know, several of us aboard, and we had to draw straws to see who was gonna go clean the yeah. propeller off. And of course, I, I got the short stick, and it was like early March or something, and uh, a little chilly in the water down there, you know, scraping off all that, you know, the, the marine growth. But, um, so check, make sure you've got forward or reverse thrust. Consider filing a float plan. Um, who regularly files a float plan when they go swimming or boating? Anybody in here? Files or let people know? Well, files a float plan, but who would you file it with? Friends. Yes. Family. Yeah, on the, on the, you can download a, a great float plan from the Coast Guard, and on it, it says, do not file with Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is kind of funny. And you think about, well, who, you, and one of the questions in one of our ASA tests is, who do you file your float plan with, right? And, um, and there's some, uh, some options. You file with the Coast Guard. How about the, uh, the dock master? You know, do you uh, um, file with the, the you know, marina office? And so, like, for instance, here, here in Harbor South, we have about, it's about you know, 600 slips here, right? And so um, if you file with them, they might you know, care about where you're going if you're having fun, but they might not miss you, when you if you don't come back on time. All right? It's going to be hard to keep track of everybody. And so the, the answer is file it with, with, with a close friend or relative, or, or preferably somebody who cares, in case you don't have a close friend or relative who cares. Who's going who's gonna to miss you, right? Um, who's most likely to tell somebody if you're gone? Like, hmm, I'm not sure. <laughs> so it's a good idea to get in the habit of filing a float plan. And what's on a float plan? It can, you can make one yourself or use an official form. It has information on your boat with a length, make, color, size, any, any distinguishing markings on your boat, how to make it identify if you see it in the water, um, who you are, what crew is aboard, when you're leaving, when you're coming back, okay? Those kind of things, all right? So whenever I go on a, um, a trip, I always file one with my mom because she's gonna miss me, all right? And usually my family's aboard too. And so I'll say, okay, we're sailing into Charleston, we should be there on Thursday. If you don't hear from me by Friday morning, the nice thing about the Coast Guard float plan Information's right on there, all right? So you can, um, it'll tell them who to call, who to notify, what to do, exactly. And so if I was like, if you don't hear from me by, you know, the day after I'm supposed to get there, then they can start get on the horn and call in and, and, and set the, the things in motion to come find me. Um, as far, other safety gear things I carry, where'd it go? Yeah, that was on my life jacket. Yeah. If you don't have a ship's e and I'm on a lot of different boats, so I don't know that we always have an e aboard. So I carry one of these little spot things here. And it's just a, it's like a personal e -perb. It will send a signal to a satellite and then go back down to the Coast Guard and let them know that I'm in trouble and they'll come find me. Um, there's a couple different buttons on here. I also have a button that'll send a satellite signal and then send some friends an email or my office an email. And it's basically, yeah, hey, I'm in trouble. It's not an emergency. I'm not dying out there, but it's like I've got in trouble. I, I need you to come get me, <laughs> all right? So it's like a come get me button, right? So it'll, then I, um, if I'm on the bay here, then I'll have a nice, you know, someone from my office come out the boat and, and pick me up or tow me back where I need to get to. So it's a really fantastic um, little gizmo to have. 
Also, you can set up, it'll send the several emails to, you, um, to whoever you decide you'd like to receive the emails, and they can track you on your trips. And it'll send one out every so often to, um, to folks, all right? So that's a great little gizmo to have. Um, this is not per se safety gear, but it's a fantastic thing to have aboard your boat, okay? Ever been out there boating and lose your hat, all right? Or like a water bottle or something, and you're like, hey, I'd like to have that back. Right? And then you gotta think about think about, well, if I can maneuver the boat to get back to this thing, but now I gotta lean over the gunnel and reach down to the water line and try to snag it as I go by. What if I fall in, right? So then sometimes you have to let it go and you don't get there back and you get, get back in time. So this little guy here is fantastic. You can kind of sit there and sail right by and pick your hat up out of the water. It's also great, you know, for, for helping keep the bay clean. If you walk, you know, you're sailing along, you're boating along and you see a plastic bag in the water, the same thing. It's like, oh, I'd like to pick that up. And, and I find lots of balloons out there, right? Those Mylar balloons, you know, people let them go and they'll end up in the water. It's like, eh, we should probably pick that up. But do I want to risk my life to pick up the balloon, all right? Probably not. But if you have one of these guys, you can get them for under 20 bucks. You know, you can kind of go by and snag it and pick it get out of the water, right? So it's a really helpful thing. Great retrieval thing. I um, used to, when we travel with our kids, they're excellent, excellent divers and retrieval people, right? So we've lost tons of things in the water. I'm like, hey, um, get that for me, you know? And, and um, Finn is, um, Finny is here. He's in the back. He's one of my oldest sons. And he, uh, um, he was our main diver guy to go retrieve stuff. So he's gotten bow rollers and all kinds of stuff that would fall off the boat and would put his mask on and send them down there, right? He would get stuff. Um, so consider following a float plan. Emergency management, part of the fun of boating is that it's a challenge, okay? I was talking to somebody else about um, last week about vacationing as we were sailing through some of the islands in the Bahamas, and I was like, you know, this is really a neat way to spend time with friends and family, all right? And one of the things is, we're, we're kind of comparing it to, do, to other types, types of vacations. For instance, like going to an amusement park or something, right? Or going to Disney World or something like that. <coughs> you know, an amusement park, if you think about the word, what does that mean? A, ah, uh, not. Muse, think, a not thinking part, okay? You don't have to think about anything. You just go and, you know, you get on this little roller coaster ride and you don't get to decide if you'd like to speed up or slow down and make a turn. It's going to do it all for you. It's all pre predetermined path, all right? So you don't get to think or plan or do anything um, together. Everything's kind of laid out for you. When you're on your boat, you're making lots of decisions and those decisions matter. And so when things go wrong, you get to make decisions, okay, how do we fix this? And one reason that it's been an awesome experience is growing up with a family on board boats a lot and, and living aboard and cruising together is that it's really helped them to grow up and take responsibility at a very young age. Um, you know, Finney was doing, by the time he was like eight and nine years old, he was doing offshore watches by himself in the middle of the night, you know? And, um, you know, we realized real fast that, that if we're going to do this well and be successful at this, you know, I'm going to have to sleep sometime if we're on a you know three or four day trip, right? And so we're going to have to involve the young people, involve the kids. So it really helps them come and kind of raise to the you know, raise up and take some responsibility, um, and it also helps them with problem solving. We will on our trips with some of the kids and stuff. If they don't navigate correctly, the bay is the bay is a very forgiving place to sail. If they run aground or something, um, and you see they're going to run aground, it's it's a muddy area. They're not going too fast. You know, we'll let them make mistakes and then help them, you know, figure out, okay, now how are you going to problem solve and get yourself out of this, all right? So the first thing you want to do is, you know, assess the situation. What's going on? Um, use the appropriate VHF call if necessary. If you need to call for help, let people know. If you're running around a channel, um, it's not an emergency, but you might want to just let folks know, going, hey, I'm um, Securite, Securite. I'm uh, running around in the middle of the channel. Um, any concerned vessel, please, you know, uh, we could come, you know, call me back. We could kind of navigate how you're going to come around. Avoid panic. Um, usually the first time something happens to you, I remember my first storm offshore, I was turned around. I was like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And once I lived through it, I was like, oh, that wasn't so bad. All right? And, and I can do this. So the next time, it wasn't, it wasn't such a, a crazy experience, all right? I was like, oh, okay, we just do this and this, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine. So you know, when panic and your emotions start rising, all right, then your decision-making abilities kind of go down, all right? So that's why it's good to go over some of these things beforehand. Take action. Stop the situation from getting worse. Recovery. Get back on course. And mitigation. Restore the boat to normal operating condition, um, conditions. You can kind of you go through this process as as you deal with things. So making the right call on the VHF radio, um, 
I much prefer using a VHF ring um, as opposed to a cell phone. If you call for help on your cell phone, and let's say you call the Coast Guard, you have to have the right number, you're going to call one little guy sitting in an office somewhere far away. All right? If you make a call on the VHF radio, all the voters around you are going to hear what's going on. And most likely, who's going to come help you is not going to be an official vote. It's going to be another voter who comes to your assistance first. All right? And so it's good. It's like a big party line. Monitor channel 16 while you're out there. And then also, if you're monitoring, then you're, if you're an extra safety measure that's, that's out there on the, on, the, on the waterways, too, for other people. Um, some of you guys know who Charlie Sessions is. He, um, the Sitchin is he's a um, charter boat captain at North. He has um, had charter groups out in the bay, and I think it's, it's at least two people that he saved for, who were having a heart attack. And he's a retired firefighter, and he heard the call on the radio. He was the closest guy to him. They pull in their fishing lines, and he goes over and saves the guy's life. You know, so it's neat to have, you know, the boating, boating community really um, looks out for each other. So use the right call. Use, use, your, use your VHF radio. Um, don't, call, don't call for a mayday right away. I was doing a uh, private class for a um, gentleman on a powerboat, and we were going down the waterway, and all of a sudden his engine just cuts out. We stop. And so here we are just sitting kind of dead in the water. He's like, do we call mayday now? And I'm like, uh, no, not quite yet. Um, <laughs> Let's, um, let's wait, and let's open your engine compartment, we'll just look inside, you know, let's try that first, you know. And it was an easily fixable problem, we got on our way very, very quickly. But don't, don't call Mayday unless it's imminent loss of life or imminent loss of vessel, okay? Those are the only two times to use that. So you're going to probably do a, a, um, other calls instead. Pon, pon, pon is an urgency alert, okay? A vessel or person aboard needs assistance, you know, or is in danger, all right? For instance, Let's say someone falls overboard, all right? And we'll go over that in a few minutes. Someone falls overboard, that's not a, um, a life and death situation in most cases, in the summertime, in the bay, on calm days, all right? Now, if, um, so, so it, it'd be a good idea, especially if you're in Harry Bay and someone falls off, to go ahead and send a pon pon out and just say, um, you know, let people know that you, you're, you're, you have a man overboard, that you're dealing with the situation, you're recovering the person, okay? Now, if you lose sight of that person, you know, that's a mayday, all right? The person will not make it if left in the water by themselves, okay? Um, security. Security is a safety alert useful for navigation um, or hazard um, or a weather, a weather alert. Um, our, the catamaran we used to live on was like 25 feet wide. And so I would just, coming down, you know, either one of the channels, here, here or north or south, I would just give a call out because there was another boat about that with coming down the, in the opposite way, we may or may not be able to pass, you know, if, especially if we're going between two marks, okay? Um, I would just call out, you know, security, security, this is selling vessel, seven seat, inbound, Rockwell Creek Channel, any concerned vessel, please, you know, respond. And then, then you know, if says anything, nothing heard, seven seat, proceeding inbound, Rockwell Creek Channel, okay? Just out of courtesy, let people know what's going on, all right? If you see a big log, we had to, um, last summer, we had some, some, huge rains and stuff, which brought some logs into Herring Bay. And um, we're out all up and down the bay. And it was a real hazard. So it was really helpful to me when I could hear people calling out and telling me of approximate locations, okay? Uh, let's see, most common emergency is fire, all right? And there was a uh, survey done by some professional captains. They came out with said the most common emergency that they've experienced or saw was fire. I've seen boats up in flames like this. Um, me and one of my sons were down around Solomon's. We saw like a 60-foot boat up in flames just from bow to stern. And it was only a captain and the mate aboard. And they had an engine room fire. It just got out of control. And they grabbed their, their life jackets and jumped overboard real quickly. And all they had was a handheld VHF. So we turned our boat around and we're over to help them. There was a, a, a fisherman that got there first. We stayed on station until we realized they were okay. Everything was, was taken care of, all right? So it happens a lot. It's, um, it's only, oh, this is up in, this is the Graysonville up over the Bay Bridge. This is their nice fire boat, all right? If you have a problem uh, up by the Bay Bridge, they'll probably come out and, and help you out. They got a call one night. Um, this was sometime last, last season. And uh, they said there's a boat on fire at the marina, so the, the, the firefighters got their stuff and zoomed off to the marina. And um, that was the boat that was on fire. Unfortunately, if you look close enough, that's uh, 
That's their boat. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, and it wasn't anything that they had done wrong. It was a connection. It was a shore power cord connection problem. All right. So go over, go over things. In fact, um, one of you know, um, most of the time, the the fires, sources of the fires, a lot of times it's the electrical system. All right. That's that's the only kind of fire that I've had aboard is an electrical fire. We were offshore and. Um, we were sailing um, you know, up and down the eastern seaboard, and we're like, yeah, you guys smell something? I'm like, yeah, I think we smell something. <laughs> so we're looking around. We smelled, smelled smoke. And it turns out that it was a cigarette lighter plug, all right, one of the 12-volt plugs, the nav station. My boat was two years old, and uh, so I, I thought everything was wired correctly, but we had plugged some appliance into it or something. And it was not rounded correctly, or it wasn't wired correctly. So it didn't, it didn't go to a fuse or to a breaker. It just went directly to the battery. And it shouldn't have been. So it was an aftermarket thing <coughs> before we probably put that thing in there. It melted down the wire behind the bulkhead. So um, we caught it before it got too bad. We were able to, to disconnect. But there, oh, we're trying to floor flip and breakers, and nothing's happening. It's still going. Right? Wow, OK, we've got to figure out how to stop this thing. So, and I'm pulling wires, and they're still hot. You know, and you're like, ow. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> we finally got it. We got finally got the wires, you know, out of there. And then what was the first thing I did was like, okay, let's disconnect this whole thing. And then later on, we'll go ahead and wire correctly because I'd like to have that that outlet there. So look at your your electrical system. Um, gasoline vapors, they can they're combustible. All right. Most of us have diesel engines now. All right. And it's um, gasoline engines are becoming less and less pre um, prevalent. But if you're cruising on a big boat, you have a diesel engine. You're going to have a dinghy and probably an outboard, and uh, with your outboard, it's going to be a gasoline outboard. And so you take that, you have to have a little bit of fuel for your gasoline outboard, so we're going to, we're going to put that gas can. And some folks will stick it in a cockpit locker. Well, a lot of times those cockpit lockers aren't vented overboard, they're not sealed from the, from the boat. And so you can easily have some gas vapors that get down to, get down to your engine room or into your bilge. Okay? So just be careful. Be careful about, about gasoline vapors. Um, uh, galley, galley fuels, different fuels. Um, in some of the older boats, they used to have the, the pressurized alcohol stoves. That um, those are pretty dangerous. If you're really careful of those, um, the smoking aboard. That's why that's why Popeye smokes a pipe, right? All right, there's no ash. Or, you know, nothing kind of gets out there, so it's all contained right there, and he, um, it's a lot safer. Um, one of our captains gave me a pipe, you know, as a kind of a, a, a gag gift one time. And it turns out they're fantastic. They're like little hand warmers, like when you're sailing along in like early spring or late fall. It's like, oh, great. So I don't, I don't smoke it much, but I sure light it as a hand warmer or something. Um, so be careful smoking aboard. Engine, um, engine fires are really common. Um, be real careful. Watch stuff on your electrical system. I'll, we'll go over. Um, holding tanks. What's in holding tanks? What gas? Methane, methane, yeah, there's, there's a fun one to clean up, right? Yeah. So make sure it's ventilated. Preventing fires aboard, ventilate, okay? Open hatches, get some um, airflow, turn on the bilge blowers, get the, everything ventilated. Um, proper fuel and oil storage, something, um, something simple about taking like that gas can and putting it in the wrong place or taking a can of oil and not having it in a, um, a locker that's vented overboard. Regular inspection of fuel and electrical systems, all right? Just take a look, watch, you know, make sure you don't, you don't have any leaks. Keep one of those oil pads, of oil absorbent pads under your engine and just watch that thing, all right? If it's collecting some, some oil, look for the leaks and get that fixed. Proper gear stowage. Something simple like having a, um, a spare life jacket laying in an engine compartment or an engine room. It can lay up against you know, the wave can, can jostle your boat a little bit, it can lay up against your alternator belt, and it can generate some heat and combust, okay? So proper gear stowage, tie things down. There was a, a gentleman over in the West River who was anchored out, and some, and, and it was a fire aboard his boat, I think this was last season, he had a, a heat, some kind of heater, I don't know through the report what, what kind of heater he had, but somehow in the night, the heater fell over and ignited the boat. And one of the homeowners up there who has a house in the water, he was looking out his window, got up to get a drink of water or something, looked out and saw a fire out in the middle of the waterway. And out of concern, he goes in and gets in his boat and drives out and saves the guy. You know, and he was apparently, you know, the fire had kind of started the back of the boat and kind of worked its way forward. The guy was in the bow of his boat, kind of holding on to the bow pulpit, 
you know, and, um, and the guy pulled up just in time and saved him. So be careful. Proper stowage, lash things down. Um, dealing with a fire, when should a fire be suppressed? Nice thing about fires is they really start small, all right? The bad thing about fires is they don't always stay small. So when should a fire be suppressed? When it's small, uh, when it first, when it first um, ignites. If you have a, a fire that's larger, and I, we usually do this in, a, in my office where there's a little waste basket about this big. Usually if you have a fire that it gets larger than a waste basket, the, um, the fire extinguishers are gonna have a board of boat, all right? The, the, the portable ones about this big. Those aren't made to put out the towering inferno, okay? They're made to put out small fires. If you have a fire that's larger than something that's about that size, then it's time to get your crew out of there, all right? You probably won't be able to extinguish it with a small fire extinguisher, okay? Those are to handle very small fires. So um, remove or limit fuel, spark, or air, all right? Break that fire triangle. Fire extinguisher procedures, use the pass method. You um, uh, pull the pin, you know, aim, um, squeeze, and sweep side to side the base of the fire. One thing we did as a, um, a family is I took some of my guys up, and we went to the Anne Arundel County Fire um, Training Department and went through a class with them about how to handle and train fires. One thing we learned was really good is one, you, um, you know, most people die from what in fires? Smoke inhalation, all right? And who's going to get smoke inhalation? The guy closest to the fire. So if you have a fire and you're going to go fight it, all right, um, have two people do it. Have one person stand there, and the other person stands behind him and grabs his belt like this, okay? When you faint, contrary to the movies, like whenever we see, in a movie someone faints, like, oh, they get shot, they fall over backwards, right? That doesn't really happen in real life. The way you fall is you fall forward. And unfortunately, if you're fighting a fire, that's where the fire is. You fall on top of it. So smoke inhalation happens, you get woozy, you faint, you fall over this way. That's why if you have someone behind you holding on to your belt loop, then if they notice that you start to, you know, um, to get lightheaded or something, they can pull you back, right? So that added safety measures. So that really helped us just at having a couple of processes to go through. Um, safety of the crew is the first priority. Um, boats replaceable, friends and family are not. So get folks out of there, be safe. All right, challenge number two, falling overboard, all right? Um, this is a guy falling over, there we go, yeah, he's, he's gonna need some help. Um, so, water safety, wear your life jacket. 84% of drowning victims did not have on a life jacket, all right? That's interesting, did not have on a life jacket. 60% um, of boaters who fall into water, 50 degrees or less, drown. All right, what's the water temperature now? Anybody know? <coughs> what was that? What was that? 38 degrees Fahrenheit. 38 degrees, okay. Um, so 60% of boaters, let's read that again, who fall into water 50 degrees or less, drown. All right, most are unconscious in 10 minutes. Um, I was down at the marina here, this was several years ago. It was me and one other guy, and it was during the week, nobody else was around. And we heard somebody yelling for help. And it was an older gentleman who was out working on his boat early one spring morning. It was 70 degrees outside, all right? But the water was still under 50 degrees. And he had fallen in the water, um, just mis misstepped from the dock to his boat. And um, his, because he had been in the water for a few minutes, all of a sudden, you know, his motor skills, when the first to go, he couldn't climb out by himself. So he was holding, I heard said in that fast, where he's holding on to one of the swim ladders and the doctor was calling for help. If, if um, you know, my friend was there, hadn't been there to help pull him out, he would not be able to get out of the water. So be, you know, respect the water, be real careful. Um, think about that. Most are unconscious within 10 minutes. So practice mid overboard drills um, with your crew. Talk about what to do. If you're the most experienced person on your boat, how are they going to get you? You know, that's the reason for my life jacket I like so much, okay? I don't need to be floating there when they try to figure out how to come around and get me, all right? And treading water. Like, okay, man, yeah, turn that thing, and drop that sail, and undo that thing, yeah. Um, so practice. Um, let me see here. Use tethers at night, adverse conditions, or when alone. Now, um, if 84%, we talked about that for a second, 84% of drowning victims did not have a life jacket on. So what happens to the other, you know, um, 15, 16%? Um, that did have their life jackets on, all right? 
if you, I was, I was interested about that. I was like, well, how can, you know, 16% of people wearing life jacket drown, all right? If you look into that, the interesting thing is most of those cases, when these, these are um, data, this data from the Coast Guard, so they take all drowning victims in the United States and come up with this data, all right? That means white water rafters, that means kayakers, that means um, canoers, all right? Um, a lot of those cases are when someone's in a kayak and the kayak overturns and it gets stuck and they can't get out, all right? They're getting trapped under for some reason, all right? Doesn't matter if you have a life jacket or not. So if you look at the data from, say, like only the Chesapeake Bay, not the tributaries, but only the Chesapeake Bay, or I found one from the Great Lakes, it was 99% of people wearing life jacket, or 99% um, of the people who drowned were not wearing life jacket, okay? So um, it's actually, you know, your, your chances of survival are really close to 100% if you wear your life jacket and you're, just, you're not whitewater kayaking, okay? Um, so wear that thing. Um, monitor crew activity. When things get rough, nobody goes forward unless we really have to. And then we're going to have jack lines set up on the boat and be attached to the boat as they go forward, all right? Know where your crew is. There was a situation last <coughs> summer. Um, I know I was out boating that day. I was um, on a cruising camp with a bunch of kids, and we were sailing along Kent Island, and somebody, a uh, gentleman on his boat, was on um, two people. One of them fell overboard, and, and they're not even sure how he fell overboard. But um, they were doing extensive search, search looking for him. And, um, and the guy you know, just realized at one point in time, he's like, hey, my, my buddy's not aboard. You know? um, what happened to him? And so they didn't know where he fell in or what happened. So, you know, be mindful of when you're, when you're putting under, you know, it's really important just to be safe. That's why I said I always, 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 if I'm in the, the cockpit by myself, if I'm at the helm by myself, I will go ahead and put that tether on, all right? Just an added safety thing. Be stay connected to the boat, all right? Don't, don't fall off. Um, um, man on board recovery. Someone at one of the, I guess that our school is an ASA school. We've got about 350 schools all over the world. Um, Ash is our uh, school coordinator, and he was doing a seminar, and someone asked him, well, you know, in this day and age, it isn't man overboard misnamed, it shouldn't be crew overboard. And he says, no, no, actually man overboard's correct, because women aren't stupid enough to fall overboard. Okay? So usually it's, it's for the women to help get the guys back in the boat. Um, a lot of electronics, a lot of equipment says man overboard or crew overboard, both are acceptable. Um, so what we do is we, we teach yell point throw set call. All right, when, I, when you say man overboard, someone falls in, somebody yells, it doesn't matter what everybody's doing, everybody comes helps and, and helps, okay? If you have a mother and their child falls overboard, what's the first reaction of the mom? Jump in. Jump in and help, okay? Don't let them do that, all right? It's much easier to save somebody from the boat if you have more help, all right? If the mother jumps in, now you have two people to save. And you might have to make that decision of which one you save, because you might not to get, be able to get both. All right? That's a bad, you don't ever want to be in that situation to have to make that decision. So don't let anybody go in the water oh, um, after them, all right? Everything happens from the boat. Um, I've got to plug in, or I'm going to lose my power. So yell, point, assign a spotter. The helmsman can't always see the person. He's worried about maneuvering the boat back to the person. So um, point, have someone, all they do is look at the person in the water, look at the victim, keep their, their finger on them. That's all they do. Everybody else can help maneuver the boat around. Um, throw the throwable. I like the, um, the life slings. I've got an example of one of these up here. These are good. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of throwables, the horseshoe, the gym buoys. You can use those. Um, but have some, something to throw into the water, even if they have a life jacket on. It's going to be easier to find the person if there's more stuff in the water, if there's an extra life jacket, extra buoy. Use a fender. I tell people, look, throw me anything in the cockpit that, that floats. You throw that to me. If the cooler's in the cockpit, throw the cooler over. It floats. And I might have a snack or something while I'm waiting for you to come get it. Okay? So, um, and I do what's, you know, I tell them, like, look, trash the waters, throw all that stuff in, cockpit cushions, those kind of things. Especially if it's offshore, it's in adverse conditions, 
you can kind of tie those things together and it gives a really big target for someone to find you, right? So that's just it's a good rule of thumb. Um, throw, set, what are you setting? You're setting your man overboard button on your chart plotter, okay? Um, so set the, hit that button. Make sure you have a you know, um, GPS coordinates of where that person went in, okay? That is really important. And then call, call is the last one. Call for help on the VHF radio, all right? If, um, and I would do that last because you're the one rescuing the person, okay? But if you have enough crew aboard, then go ahead and make the call. Start with the pond pond as long as you have everything, to, as long as you can, um, you have everything under control, okay? And bring the person aboard. Skipper maneuvers the boat to the man overboard. Um, any method, there's different methods for power um, boats and sailboats. Um, we teach several different methods. We're not gonna go over all of them now, but then approach from downwind. Um, bringing the man, the man overboard back aboard, all right? Now, especially if it's a little bit cold, you know, the, the water's a little cold, they're losing some motor skills, they might not be able to climb up the swim ladder, all right? That's your first choice. How do you get them back on board? You know, hoist, if it's a sailboat, you can hoist them up with a halyard. Um, another method is, and, and it's good to think through this before it happens, you're like, mm, the person's in the water, and how do we get them back on board? Especially with a high freeboard on boats. Um, lower the dinghy down, it's easy to get them from the water to a dinghy, okay? Go from the water to the dinghy, and then from the dinghy up to the boat. That's another option. Um, use a life sling or a rope or sail elevator, and those guys are, um, that's a, a, an elevator. It's a specifically made. You can use a sail for this, or you can make one yourself using a line and help scooping a person up. This thing is really helpful for if a person's incapacitated, if they're, if they're unconscious. All right, how are you gonna get them aboard, right? It's very difficult to get a line around somebody who's unconscious. Bring them back um, with one of these. Or here's a life sling. That's what's in this little bag I have right here. You can use that to hoist them aboard. All right, crew overboard products. Here's a crew watcher. This thing is, is, is fairly, you know, they're just starting to come out with these. They're fantastic. Those little capsules you can put aboard everybody's life jacket, all right, or, or lash to the life jacket. If it hits the water, they'll have an alarm and it will send a, a, um, a message to your cell phone that someone's in the water, let them know the location. Um, Ray Marine has one. It's a, you can put it in your life jacket around your wrist. Someone falls in the water, it automatically, it, um, it, it, it hits the spot on your, on your chart plotter, lets, them, lets you know where the person's in the water. So it's good to have an alarm, um, especially if you're on a longer trip and you're by yourself in the, in the cockpit or you're, on, you're, take, you're rotating, taking turns to helm. If you go over, a lot of times they don't know for a couple hours later until the next person comes up for a watch or kind of takes their turn at the helm, okay? Just let them know right away. Um, challenge number three, <laughs> running aground. All right, so how many people have run aground before? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, how many people have never run aground before? Raise your hands. Okay. Now how many of you who just raised your hands are lying? Raise your hand. <laughs> Last time I ran aground was... Let me think. I think that was a long time ago, wasn't it? No. It was, it was last week, I think it was. It might have been, yeah, that was last week. Um, this, is, um, this is me um, and some of my kids were sailing in the Bahamas a couple days ago, and this is right before I ran aground, okay? Um, and I know this was shameless, but showing a picture of me sailing in the Bahamas a couple days ago. I'm sorry. Um, but we had no excuse. You can see the bottom of the, of, of the seabed, right? And we were trying to cut this point out. In my defense, we were tacking out of a very narrow mangrove you know, channel and stuff. And um, the good news is the boat only draws like about a foot and a half you know, with the board up. And, um, and it was only blowing maybe you know, five knots, all right? So it wasn't a catastrophic you know, event. We just, you know, one of us stepped over and just pushed us back into deep water. So, you know, <laughs> catastrophe averted right there. Um, Precautions in shallow water, all right? Here is a, um, on the left right there, it's a hand, um, it's a handheld depth meter. I traveled with one of those for years. It's fantastic. You might anchor your boat in a certain area. You wanna make sure your swing room has enough, has enough water. Just drive around the dinghy and just check the area around. We would use that a lot. Um, the other is a lead line. I also have one of those. Um, my <coughs> handheld one, after several years of use, corroded and it doesn't work anymore, all right? My lead line still works, all right? It doesn't need batteries. So um, here's some precautions. Stay in the charted depths and the tide tables, all right? 
Go over them before you before you leave. Predict shoaling areas. Where is going to be like um, when I ran around last week? I'd probably keep as a little point I was going around. I probably should be a little more careful around that point because things are going to shoal around rocks, around jetties, around points. Um, so just kind of get an idea of where, where is going to be a problem area. Where is it going to fill in? You know, I've had people call me and say, "Hey, I'm 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 in a channel, but I ran aground." It's like, "Yeah, but you're you're on the very edge of the channel, aren't you?" It's like, "Yeah, but I'm between the marks." I'm like, "Yeah, you're pretty close to the mark, aren't you?" They're like, "Okay, yeah, I'm right by the mark." It's like, "Well, well, where do channels fill in from? They don't fill in from the middle, all right? They fill in from the edges." Okay, so what I will do, and if I'm in a narrow channel, I'll stay right in the middle of the channel, and if another boat is coming. I'll just scoot over and we'll pass and then we'll come back. I'll go back to the middle. So predict where it's going to happen. You know, what's, whatever the problem part, point's going to be. Enter unfamiliar harbors only on a rising tide. Okay. Reason being, if you mess up and you, you run aground, we just wait a few minutes. The tide will come in and float you right back off. You'll be good. Um, if you're on a falling tide, you've got a quite a long time to, to wait. Check swing area after you anchor. Make sure you've got plenty of room around there. Um, uh, getting free from the bottom, immediately shift to neutral if you're in a power boat, if you're in a sailboat, depower your sail or tack the boat so you're getting driven off the shoal rather than back onto the shoal or further on. So depower the boat, um, heal the boat, all right? If you can move to one side or the other, put all your crew, rate, crew weight on one side, see if you can lean that over. Sometimes you can pop the, the keel out of the, the mud or the bottom just enough to get yourself off. Um, shift weight of the crew, even on a power boat, usually, you know, the boats or the bow of boats kind of shaped like this, and your deepest part is going to be in the back of the boat. So a lot of times if you bring all your crew to the, to the bow and put all the crew weight there, that's enough to, get, to give you a little bit extra clearance and you can kind of get the boat off. All right? Uh, use the engine with caution to reverse out. Why? Because most engines are cooled with, with seawater, right? And if you're making contact with the bottom, you're stirring things up, and that's going to be sucked up into your water intake, cooling water intake, all right? And that can destroy your, your impeller, and then you're, now you're going to be aground and overheating, okay? So be cautious. Go real slow and try to monitor what's going on. Um, kedge off using an anchor. Anybody ever kedge off before? Yeah, yeah, okay. A lot of you guys have done that. Take a, a line out, all right, with an anchor and set it off far away and then use a winch or something to pull yourself over to it. Um, wait for high tide, pad the hull if needed. The nice thing about the Chesapeake Bay is our tidal barrage is only a few feet. Um, usually if you run aground, you're not going to dry out, all right? But if you're in an area outside the bay, um, there's a real possibility if you run aground that you, the, 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 the area underneath you could all dry out. You could be on hard, hard ground when the tide goes all the way out. All right, um, that happened, well, I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, take, a, take a tow. Now, usually the last option is going to take a tow, not because I don't appreciate Towboat US very, very much, and they've saved me a couple times, but um, I want to see if I can fix this problem on my own. You know, see what you can do. Build your seamanship skills. Take a tow. We always call it the little red boat of shame. You know, <laughs> a boat comes out, tows you, and you know, hang your heads. All right. All right. Didn't get off myself. So um, try to do everything you can. This is a good um, illustration of, of kedging off, bring an anchor out to deep water. If you don't have a dinghy, all right? Now, we, usually we would carry several anchors aboard when I'm cruising. Um, I carry, gosh, when we're cruising full time, I would carry about five anchors, you know, for different situations. But I uh, always have a very light aluminum anchor for kedging off, all right? And my primary anchor was on all chain. So if you've ever tried to kedge, get a kedge anchor, anchor into a dinghy and row out with all chain, all right, all of a sudden you realize how out of shape you really are, okay? Because that chain acts like a big spring bringing you right back to the boat. So um, use a, have a, have a kedging anchor that's, uh, that's primarily all line, maybe a little bit chain at the end, put your dinghy and then you can row it out. Um, if, you're, if you just um, have, are on a smaller boat, and this is a good option too, if you don't have a if you don't have a dinghy, how do you get, it? How do you get a, um, an anchor out? Um, you can take a, an anchor and put it on some life jackets, all right, and swim it out, all right? Um, put it on some fenders and swim it out, and then place it down and, and, and pull yourself off. Um, all right, so here's a picture, um, again, last week, and we're in the Bahamas and the island, nice blue water. If um, you look at the boat behind, behind us, 
Um, there's a, a little um, rent, or charter boat, or there's a little rental boat there. Um, I missed the picture, but just to the other side of it, there were some folks that pulled up at low tide. And they pulled up at low tide and just bow up to the beach, and they threw their, their anchor over, and they were exploring this nice little um, island there. And uh, they didn't think about the tide. Remember the first thing I said was check the tide, all right? Check weather and tide. Well, the tide went out, and their boat was high and dry. They came back. So we looked, and I, I wish I'd have gotten a picture of them. But there was this nice gentleman and his wife, or you know, a significant other, and they were just kind of sunbathing on the beach next to their boat, right? There was, there was no getting this thing out of there. So they were, they were there for the long haul, the six hour or 12 hour tide cycle, right? Until they're gonna get, get, get floated off of that thing again. So anyway, um, if you, you know, look at, up at the top, you can tell by the water differences, it's more blue um, here, and it's the, the whiter part, it's shallower water. So be careful, make sure you, you, you know where the tide is and what's gonna, what's gonna happen with it here. Um, if you look up, this was no name, name key, totally off topic, but if you look up in the right corner here, you can see little pig, you heard little swimming pigs up in the islands and stuff, you know, this is, um, this is my son feeding a bunch of little swimming pigs on, on no name key, all right? So, um, anyway, and I, this is, you know, we were spear fishing one day, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how these pictures got in here. Um, <laughs> lobster diving and spear fishing and stuff, and it's, so a safety issue with this is, um, oh yeah, here's a safety issue right here. We have a rule. All right, if you ever do find yourself in the islands and do some spear fishing, we have a two, we have a two fish rule. All right, you go down and you get two fish. Um, um, if you, especially these hogfish, if you hit them, they vibrate and make this horrible sound that attracts, you know, big things, big things. <laughs> and so um, we get two fish and then we'll put them in the dinghy and we'll go to a different spot, all right? So this is a, if you look real quick, I'm, I'm not a great shark photographer. I wasn't gonna swim any closer to get a better picture. I'm like, this is cool enough for me. So um, two fish rule, then get them, um, get back in the boat and go somewhere. This guy was really interested in what we were doing. Challenge four, um, engine failure, okay? You're going along and all of a sudden the engine cuts out. I told you a story about um, earlier about what a power boat that happened to me. But um, when your engine stops, it's not a very good feeling. N immediately shift to, to neutral. If it's still running and it just is not working, shift to neutral and then turn it off. Um, regain control of the vessel. If you're on a sailboat, start sailing. If you can't start sailing, then anchor the vessel, all right? Then you're not just at the mercy of the wind and waves. You're, 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 you're stationary, and you can start working on the problem. Uh, inspect and listen. See what's going on. Uh, address simple problems. Um, fouled fuel. I can't tell you how many times. All it's been was a clogged fuel filter, all right? And especially in power boats, for some reason, they, fuel filters will clog a lot. And I was, um, I was bringing a boat down from, um, where was that, down in Virginia, up to here. And I told the owner, I said, okay, listen, that's what I want, the gear that I need to make sure we have this gear board, this gear board, and I said, and make sure I've got like, you know, three or four fuel, fuel filters that fit your boat. And he's like, oh yeah, 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 they're aboard. I'm like, are you sure they're aboard? I'm like, yeah. he's like, yeah, 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 they're, they're aboard, all right? So I'm like, okay, they're aboard. So um, about halfway through the trip, somewhere around Solomon's, you know, all of a sudden his boat's like, we're up on a plane, everything's going well, so it's like, sure enough. Um, cloud fuel filter, right? Something's going on, not getting fuel. So um, I go back in the cabinet where he said the fuel filters, oh, and I called him, oh, yeah, I, I forgot to put those aboard. I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> so a lot of cases, for, it's something simple. It can be um, a fouled fuel filter or a water filter, um, cooling water in the bay here where the jellyfish come in, they will get sucked up into your water intake and it will stop the cooling water and the engine will overheat and shut down, okay? So all it takes is opening the, um, the strainer and emptying out the jellyfish, then you're good to go. I had somebody take one of our, our charter boats out uh, last summer, the summer, uh, summer before. The, um, it was on Mother's Day, I remember, really, really well. They called and they said, hey, the engine overheated and we don't know what to do, in fact, and, and we were gonna send somebody out to get them and stuff, and, um, and, we, and we got out there and they, and they, they said, listen, we're, we can't um, wait any longer, we've got some other things we, like, we gotta do, but we're, they were really upset because it ruined their whole Mother's Day, and they left the boat over <coughs> on one of the docks, and like, oh, just leave it there, we'll go get it. I'm really sorry, I'm not sure what happened. So I went over there, we fired the boat up, and um, it was fine. It ran well, and it wasn't overheating. We brought it back to the dock and everything was fine. And this poor you know, family bringing their mom out for Mother's Day, 
had a bummer of experience and didn't get to go boating on a beautiful day. And so we were trying to you know, come up with, okay, what happened? And most likely, it was probably a plastic bag that got sucked up under the intake and was just kind of held against the hull. And as soon as the uh, engine shuts down, you know, the bag floats off. Okay, so all you had to do was turn the engine off and turn it back on. <laughs> and, and you'd have been fine. So, you know, check the intake. Make sure you have cooling water flowing, all right? So something very simple like that. Um, low oil. Sometimes if your oil pressure is, or the oil is low, the oil pressure, and then you have an oil pressure alarm, and sometimes the oil pressure switch is, is wired to your ignition switch, it'll turn off the engine, okay? Use a, if you can't fix it, use a dinghy as a tug, um, or last resort, call the little red boat of shame, brought back from Rena, uh, one of the wonderful mechanics, go ahead and take a look for you. Challenge five is a fouled propeller. All right, how many picked up a crab pot in Herring Bay? You know, no, one couple, okay, a couple of honest folks here, all right. We had some folks um, take out one of our boats, and it was these two ladies, really sweet lady, it was one of our small sailboats, it's like a 20, 22 foot <coughs> sailboat, and they, they came in, like Catalina, you know, 22 or something, or 25, and they came in, they said, we're not really sure what's going on. The boat's going really, really slow, and I'm like, Huh, like, yeah, there's just no, the engine seems to be working fine, but there's just no power. We're going like about a half a knot all the way into the marina. And I'm like, well, I'm looking at the boat, and, I'm, and, and there was a, um, one of those crab floats like around the rudder in the back, you know? And I'm like, well, it might be the crab pot you're dragging in. They're just like, oh no, am I in trouble? I'm like, well, it depends. If you have enough for me, my wife has some more d'oeuvres tonight in the pot, we're good. But if you're if you drug in an empty pot, then you're in trouble, okay? So. Um, be careful about the crab pots. Marine growth, I told you before about that time when um, we had thrust, but there was no power. It was just moving water around, and our propeller looked very similar to this. Okay? You need to have smooth blades to be able to have, have thrust. So keep, your, keep the, um, the blades clean. Line overboard can get caught into um, the propeller and seize things up. Um, procedures, shift engine into neutral immediately. Sometimes it takes a while to turn the engine off, so put it in neutral. Um, regain control of the vessel, start sailing or anchor, all right? And then identify the problem. What's going on here? How can I fix this? Inspect your bilge and shaft on the inside of the boat, all right? Uh, make sure you're not, there's no leaks, nothing's bent, everything's working fine on the inside, just check the machinery. And use a boat hook to reach the fouled line. If um, sometimes, and we've been able to do this before, you take, a, you take the line get with the boat hook, Pull it. If you have somebody rotate the shaft and reverse on the inside, sometimes you can rotate that thing off without having to, um, to do anything further. And then lastly, you know, dive on the prop if needed. Um, one of the things I have in my, um, my sailing bag is I will usually carry, if I, if I don't have a, um, any dive gear with me, I'll at least carry a pair of swim goggles, okay? Just to be able to um, go down and see what's going on and if I have to cut a line free from my, my propeller. Yes. Gloves are nice too. Gloves are nice. Yes, you'll get cut up, right? Yeah, you need a pair of garden gloves. Yeah, good idea. Uh, challenge six: dragging anchor. These guys, um, all these dinghies, are not just being good Samaritans. They're basically from other boats. Wine's guy not to drag into their boat. Okay, so everybody's out there helping. All right. Um, so helping your anchor to hold. Increase scope of anchor road. All right, match your anchor to the bottom type. Um, watch other boats and how they are anchored. Check weather and be prepared for, um, for building wind or wind shifts. Inspect changes in vessel motions or sound. Set up an anchor watch in adverse conditions and then re-anchor if necessary. I love spending nights in the boat at anchor. It's such a wonderful experience. Um, and every once in a while you'll drag and you just want to make sure you can take care of it. We were, one of my, um, my, my youngest son and I were out, just right out, right out here. We, we um, came out just for an, an evening together. We anchored right there. And one of the things is, you know, in, you know, inspect the sound and motion of the boat, right? The way boat, boats are set up, the anchor is always off your bow. And so you have some gentle waves coming in at you. You know, it kind of rides nicely like this, right? So this is a good feeling, right? Usually when you start dragging, the first thing that's going to happen is your bow's going to get blown downwind, and now all of a sudden the boat's going to start going side to side, all right? So when I'm aboard a boat and the boat does this, I just automatically wake up <laughs> when I check things going on. So I'm just out here, and sure enough, you know, the boat was kind of going side to side. I'm like, eh, this doesn't feel right. I'm going to go check that. And so I 
got up and, and we were dragging. We were like, oh, this, is, this isn't where I put my boat. No, I was somewhere I was closer in. So um, just pulled up and just re-anchored. It was, the, it was the anchor was fouled and I didn't have to turn the engine on. Just pulled it up and, and let it go and reset it and it was fine. Um, another time, you know, one of the other things is that, you know, check weather and make sure what's going, you know, make sure you know what's going to happen. Um, I don't like being unprepared, but one night I was anchored out in front of in front of North with some some friends, and it was a beautiful evening. Um, we were grilling that evening, and the, and the weather report was for five to ten knots, you know, from the west. Perfect for anchoring in Herring Bay, and throughout the night it was it was fine that evening. It was beautiful. Went to bed. I woke up like about two o'clock in the morning. And, and it was like, you know, five foot seas coming out of the southeast, right? Horrible direction. And the boat was just like, you know, lurching and everything and bashing into the waves and stuff. And, you know, there's really nowhere to go at that point, right? I'm like, ah, this is, I'm not, and my, we're dragging, but I'm like, I'm just not going to sleep very well like this. I think we're just going to pull up the anchor and go into the marina and tie up there. So that's what we did. We just decided that it was just going to be uncomfortable. So totally, you know, in a total anomaly, total weather change, it wasn't in the forecast. But we just went ahead and, and, and made different plans. Uh, challenge number seven, taking on water. Um, get that sinking feeling. Um, one time, um, oh wait, that's not us taking on water. That was last week, me sailing in the Bahamas. <laughs> that's, uh, sorry, that boat's taking on water. It's, a, it's about time for him to put the bilge pump on, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. so I'll tell you a story of my, my son, Finney. He was like, um, he's a captain now. He's one of our instructors. He's an amazing boater and sailor. Um, he was about four years old, and we were on a, on a trip. With, um, he was on a trip with me, and it was just the two of us. And I'm at the helm. He's down there taking a nap or something. He comes up. He pokes his head out of the hatch. He goes, Dad, are, are the floorboard supposed to be floating? I'm like, well, no, son. No, they're not. Why don't you come up here and take the helm? I'll, I'll go with <laughs> He's like, okay. So sure enough, the floorboards are all floating inside the cabin and stuff. So. It was something simple, you know, a popped hose clamp on a, you know, a bilge pump outlet. It, it, it was something very simple we were able to fix. But, but you know, just monitor things. So, um, dealing with a leak, early detection by regular bilge checks. All right. Um, first thing to do is engage the bilge pump. All right. Start, start pumping out. Make some progress. Close all seacocks. <coughs> Go through. Most of the time, if you have a leak, it's from a hole in your boat. All right, and if it's a hole in your boat, it's probably a, a pre-existing hole, like a through hole. Okay, so go check those first. Uh, taste the water. All right. One time I was offshore and I opened my bilge, my regular bilge check, and it was full of water. And I'm like, <gasps> and I thought I was sinking, you know. And I tasted the water. I'm like, it's fresh water. I'm like, can, can I carry enough water in my water tanks to sink my boat? I'm like, I don't think I can. I'm, like, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so what had happened is my hot water heater. Um, the relief valve had gone bad, and it dumped all our fresh water into the bilge. All right, so now we had a new problem, we don't need fresh water, but you know, at least we weren't sinking. So taste the water. Is it rain water? Is it fresh water? Then you, you know, you're not, you don't have a hole in your hull. Uh, chase upstream to the source. That's why early detection is really important, okay? It's easy to tell. Once the, once the water rises above the source, that's really hard to find that source. Uh, use softwood plugs for failed through hull fittings. Um, this is one of the, this is a softwood plug here. Just make sure you have, a, you know, these aboard your boat. This is a failed through hull fitting. Um, we were opening and closing this thing, and turns out we weren't opening and closing at all because the handle works, but the little ball valve inside there doesn't work anymore. So that was seized. We ripped it out and put a new one in. So um, if, if one of these is broken, just put it in there and tap it in with a hammer, and the soft wood will absorb water, and it will just seal that hole really well. We had um, one, of my, one of my guys was working on a, on a boat, and he leaned against this thing. It was under the galley sink, and this is the galley sink outlet. He just kind of leaned against it, and it broke off. And we hadn't even, didn't even seen the corrosion around there. It just broke off. And he, and he calls me. He's like, it's, you know, it's, it's flowing. What do I do? I got time. And, we're, and there's a huge hole in the boat. And I, I told him, I said, well, well plug the hole. He's like, oh, yeah. Puts his hand over. <laughs> like, now get the, the softwood plug and put it in place. He's like, oh yeah. And so he puts that in there. Like, okay, now he's not sinking anymore, right? And the bilge pump can take care of it. So um, use your softwood plugs, have them available. One guy showed me a, a great trick. He takes the softwood plugs, puts one of those picture hanger, like little eyelet things in there, screws into the top, and then takes a line and ties it around every through hole right, on his boat. 
Now, like, that's a great idea. That way you don't have to go find them. You know the correct size one is right there for whenever you need it. Um, use a towel or a t-shirt for an odd-shaped hole if it's a strange shape. Use something just to slow the flow down, okay? And, um, or, or brace a cushion for a, for a large, um, large, larger damage to the hull. You can use a, um, you know, a cockpit cushion, use a throwable PFD, put it against, we'll use a boat hook, and I never have to do this, but we know how to do it. You know, you, boat hooks are adjustable, so you can <coughs> put it in and wedge it between the cabin and the hull and kind of, you know, brace that in place. Anything you can do, there's all kinds of, um, of large, um, there's, there's patch kits you can get. All kinds of things, but usually, if um, it's 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 um, most common things, right, it's going to be a small small leak or a through hole or something like that's going on. Um, here's the softwood plugs. I like these foam plugs too. Um, they're expensive, so usually people only get one of those. It's like that's fine, but you, just, you know they're not going to have it every location on, on on every one. You just got an essential location. Um, up at the top, if you look at the top left right there, we had this happen on our boats last one of our boats last season. <coughs> Somebody had put, if you look at up here, so this, is, this is bronze, but somebody had taken a cheap brass fitting and put it in here. Brass is not what you want aboard a boat. You want the bronze fittings. And so the brass corroded and it just broke off, all right? And so the nice thing is it broke off um, um, inside of the through hull and we were just able to shut it off and, and go ahead and, um, and fix it and put a new one on. Down at the bottom here are two properly installed through hulls um, and the seacocks. It's uh, grounded to the grounding system on the boat. It's double hose clamped. So that's what you want it, want it to look like. So be, you know, know where your through hulls on your boat. It's a good idea to draw a little chart or map of your boat and then have them in the locations all written out for yourself, okay? Uh, challenge eight, we have a couple more to go. Collision, um, this happened last, anybody see this picture from last summer? Um, so who had right away in this one? You know. Most likely the sailboat, probably. <laughs> so um, I heard that this was a it was a very new charter cap. It was one of his first trips out. Someone told me it was his first trip. First you know, time the boat was out. it was the first time the boat was out. Yes, brand new boat. Okay. And it was a J port sailboat. Yeah, it was a J, it was a J port sailboat. I, I know one of the guys who sailed on that boat, right? Yeah. So um, so first time, first charter for the for the guy, and uh, not a not a great. Um, ending to that. So procedure after contact, check the safety of your crew. Make sure everybody's fine, all right? Same thing in small boats when someone capsizes. The first thing we ask is, are you okay? Everybody fine, all right? Get the crew together. Make sure everybody's good. I'm good. Assess the damage to the boat. If none of the vessel's involved, avoid further damage, okay? Um, be careful. If they're, if they're connected and you unconnect them, you're going to leave a hole that's going to sink the boats down, all right? So think about that. Um, if... Um, Exchange information with the others involved. If able to get, um, get underway, sailor power, return back to, um, to base or dock. Call for a tow if necessary, if you need, if you need help. Um, report to the authorities if required. More, if more than, more than $2,000 worth of damage is done to the boat or vessel, you, you're required to my law to contact the authorities, okay? Coast Guard or DNR. All right. Um, challenge nine, steering failure. Um, has anybody ever been out at sea and had your steering go out on you? Anybody? No one yet? Rudder fell off. Rudder fell off? Okay, you had a rudder fall off. I've had that happen. I've had so steering. The rudder just Uh-huh. The boat should just wore out. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was bad weather. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've had steering go out on me several times. There's a lot of linkage inside of here that, um, that can fail. All right, that's why every boat will have, um, with, with a steering system like this, will have an emergency tiller. Find your emergency tiller, know how it goes in, all right? Happening on one boat where I had a, um, an emergency tiller, I knew where it was, but I had never set it up and practiced, okay? So practice doing this. Um, steering failed, we got the emergency tiller out, it was an older boat, the fitting had warped over time and it wouldn't actually go over the rudder post. I'm like, well, this is not going to do us any good. <laughs> so that was tough bringing that boat in. So um, find, make sure you know where your, your emergency tiller is. Make sure it works. Language failure. Install your emergency tiller. Get the vessel back under control, you know, or anchor the boat. Um, inspect for easily fixable problems. The steering mechanism goes to a quadrant, and the quadrant attaches 
um, to your, your runner post, right? And one time the bolts that, on that attachment point had just come loose over, over, over time. And so I had no stairs, but all we had to do was tighten down a couple of bolts, and that would fix the problem. So it's just look and see, hey, that might be something simple. I can probably <coughs> fix that. Um, steer with, with, with um, the engines um, on a twin engine vessel. A lot of power boats, you don't need the wheel to dock your boat. Okay? In fact, you need to use the twin engine. So you can steer, bring it back in under engine if you, if you, if you need to. Um, steer with the autopilot. In many cases, your autopilot is an independent unit from your steering system. Okay? Um, and I've used the autopilot steer boat in a lot of cases. Um, here's a guy, he had, kind of like what you guys had, the, the failure of your whole rudder system. So then an emergency tiller is not going to help you out if your rudder's gone. So he had fashioned a, a makeshift, makeshift rudder with a spinnaker pole or a boat hook or something, lashed in the back of his boat, he was able to steer the boat back to, back to harbor. All right, so challenge 10, lastly, squalls, thunderstorms. If you sail in the bay enough, you're going to get hit by a squall or a thunderstorm, okay? Uh, this is a boat out there having a great time. Um, storm safety, monitor the VHF channel on 16, and, um, um, and monitor the radar. The nice thing about, um, a lot of boats I'm on now don't have, um, don't have radar systems on them, but you can have, there are great radar apps for your phone. So you can just watch and see what's coming at you, okay? So if you monitor the, the VHF, they'll tell you. Um, but they do come up quickly on the bay here. We were doing a, um, gosh, this is several years ago, we were doing a, um, a Wednesday night race out here, and um, this huge storm came up, and it was blowing maybe 15 knots, and it went to over 50 knots, like really, really quickly, right? And it was just honking, and so our, our jib just blew off the boat, it's like pow, you know, and we didn't have time to take it down. And we didn't have time to reef either, so it just was so fast. So we pulled the sail aboard, and we were just, you know, um, let it spilling all the air we could, just kind of just kind of hang on, and, and it lasted for a while, maybe you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes or so, and then once once the visibility and the visibility was like zero, we couldn't see anything around us, and um, once the visibility you know came back a little bit, we're like, what's that in front of us? It was the mark we were supposed to round. I'm like, well, you know, we might as well keep we're here. Let's go ahead and round it and then head back, right? So we rounded the mark, and it turns out. Um, Everybody else had gone back to you know back to the marina you know because it was so bad and we're like we're the only idiots still out there. It's like well the good thing is I won the race because nobody else was there to beat me. You know it was like, like all right. This <laughs> is so. Um, then we were able to make it back. So monitor the VHF radio. A lot of times the coast guard will break in if there's a severe weather warning or something's coming towards you. Um, have crew put on life jackets if you don't require your, your crew to wear life jackets right before things get bad or as as, as things that start to deteriorate. Put your life jacket on, have your crew put them on. Um, put harnesses on, use tethers. If possible, return to dock and anchor prior to the storm. If you don't have enough time, I don't recommend doing that. But if you can get back and get, to, um, get, and get um, secured before it hits, you know, go ahead, by all means do that. The last place I wanna be when the wind starts kicking up to 40, 50 knots is, is, is right between the two jetty breakwaters coming into south, right? Yeah. Um, I don't want to slide into them or get blown with wind pitch there. So if you can get secure beforehand, great. If not, prepare early. Reef down sails. Secure loose items on deck. Things will be, become projectiles. Um, take down bimini's or cockpit awnings. I had a cockpit awning up one time, and we rode out the store over on the eastern shore, and it got over 50 knots. And we didn't have time to take down the cockpit awning. And so the, the metal rod, the aluminum rod that held that thing up, snapped. Right? And I'm at the helm, and, and this thing snapped, and the wind is just kind of like beating me to death. It's like whack, whack, whack. I'm like, ow, ow. <laughs> so it would have been really helpful to get that down beforehand. So prepare early. Get things secured. Um, send non-essential crew below, all right? Um, if they're not going to help you handle the boat in this adverse conditions, get them out of the way, all right? Get them down below. They're just going to be in the way and cause more problems. So just get them below. Just say, hey, put your life jackets on. Get below. Um, we'll handle the boat right now, and people aren't going to like being out in, in sideways rain because it hurts anyway, so um, secure the boat. We were coming in after a, one of the, a couple years ago, it was um, during the fireworks display, after the fireworks display here at South, there was a, a bad thunderstorm. And we were trying to race that thing in, trying to get back to dock before it hit, but we didn't make it. We were in the marina already, and it was too late. We couldn't wait it outside. And so we just send everybody below. We're like, okay, guys, we had a lot of folks after just see the fireworks. Like, everybody get down below, just hold on to something. 
and I've got a couple of my guys who are great, great, you know, seamen. And like, okay, I need you. I need you to help me get the lines on the first time this time. Okay, <laughs> and we got one shot to get in here, get them up, and sure they did a great job. We got tied up, and it was fine. And then we had to all clear and come up. Um, avoid touching anything metal. All right, um, it's really eerie when you get the thunderstorm. And I've been out there where it's like hitting all around you, and it's not hitting your boat, but it's all around. It's like, oh, it's just it's bad, you know. And um, I've never been hit by lightning. But I have some friends who have been hit. But you don't want to be like you know holding onto the shrouds or something or holding onto the mast, right? Don't, don't do that <laughs> in a lightning storm. Um, head out to open water if possible. Get away from the lee shore. If the boat's going to drift, you got to run off a little bit. You want some running room, okay? So head out, um, get in open water. Um, heave to or drop sails. Motor until um, the storm passes. Um, people have different um, different. Uh, techniques that are better in the bay, I find heaving too may work, except you don't, a lot of times you don't have a lot of room to run to leeward, and so heaving too might not be the best option for you. If you don't have a storm sail, uh, and, you're, and you're, your current sails can't handle that much wind, go ahead and drop sails. And once you ride through a couple of them, you'll go, you know what, this isn't that bad. You just want to know what to do and feel confident you can handle your boat when, it, when the wind really picks up. And the nice thing about the bay is once, you know, if we do have a bad storm, it doesn't last that long. And um, it'll eventually clear, and then you can head back in. Um, that is um, the end of 10. And you can see me. I'm anchored right out here during the sunset. That was <laughs> last week, but now we're back here. We're back on the any, any questions um, on any of the 10 things I've gone over? I know we're kind of covering a lot of material really quickly. Any questions anybody has? No? OK. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the time.